the natural community was going a little bit hard on preventing antioxidant intake, especially around uh, training, because it blunts the post-exercise stress response. And of course, 90s need every angle they can get so they would not take antioxidant. And then the steroid community did a poor extrapolation from that. Mm -hmm. We don't need it too, because otherwise our steroids are not going to work. So they avoided antioxidants altogether. Well, that's a good way to get to kidney problems if you're running baldadone or perhaps some other Storage. And, and the funny thing is, like these these studies that were performed in Bolden on Bolden on the animals and the humans have not been reproduced in other steroids. So based on the chemical composition, it's very likely that any kind of steroid due to oxidative stress could cause some kidney problems. But unfortunately, it's never been studied. Do we have data to say, like what we've discussed in the past with the steroid ranking that certain steroids are more nephrotoxic towards the kidneys. I don't I don't think we have that data other than the rabbit study that we always bring up about baldenone. Yeah. Um, well, the, there's actually quite a few studies that study the effects of baldenone in uh, animals and humans. And the humans are all retrospective studies, obviously, because it would be unethical to kind of prescribe people baldenone and then uh, see what happens on with the kidneys. But long story short, the conclusions of most of these studies show that the nephrotoxic effects of boldenone can be prevented or ameliorated with antioxidants, yeah, whether vitamin that's C. Uh, vitamin C or a royal jelly. So that's an extract in the honey production process. Um, what was it? Uh, cordyceps and a few other things that ameliorated the negative effects of boldenone. So I always recommend it if you run boldenone, which is the only steroid that has been studied in the context of kidney toxicity. I think there was one Deannibal study as well showing some kidney toxicity, um, that it, it's very important to take your antioxidants. And luckily people are now coming full circle to reintroduce antioxidants again because you know, the, uh, the the natural community was going a little bit hard on preventing antioxidant intake, especially around uh, training, um, you know, around the train before or after, because it blunts the post-exercise stress response. And of course, 90s need every angle they can get so they would not take antioxidants. And then the steroid community did a poor extrapolation from that. Mm -hmm. time. We don't need it too, because otherwise our steroids are not going to work. And so they, they uh, avoided antioxidants altogether. Well, that's a good way to get to kidney problems if you're running baldenone or perhaps some other steroids. And, and the funny thing is, like these, these studies that were performed in baldenone uh, on the animals and the humans have not been reproduced in other steroids. So based on the chemical composition, it's very likely that any kind of steroid due to oxidative stress could cause some kidney problems. Um, but unfortunately, it's never been studied. So people say that boldenone is kidney toxic. Yes, but the other steroids probably also, unless you take some freaking antioxidants. Uh, and it seems not to matter what kind of antioxidant, uh, as long as you take some antioxidant. And it could be methylene blue, glutathione, NAC, vitamin E. Um, estradiol has some anti uh, oxidant effects in the endothelium. So I, I think if you keep your antioxidant status quite high, you're already preventing a world of pain later on in life. And that always makes me wonder, all these bodybuilders that got kidney problems, how bad was their oxidative stress? You know, in hindsight. I guess... In the, uh, I was just going to say, in the human studies, was the, the EQ run solo? Well, it was when it's perennial. Right, not equipoise. Yeah, perenable. Yeah, so so um, some some were used perenable, and others were using underground labs. So you don't know the carrier oil, you don't know how much benzoyl, benzoyl, benzoyl alcohol was used. Some people are allergic to those. Um, you don't know they weren't tested. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I would say standard for EQ would be two and twenty for BABB. Yeah, so mm -hmm. like in order to make it liquid at two hundred. What? Um, now I was just curious because I wonder if. If it were used solo, if the suppression, the full suppression of estradiol from the EQ alone could have just allowed some oxidative stress to occur. Exactly. Right. Yep. So it wasn't necessarily, again, EQ directly. It was what else the EQ on its, like who would run EQ on its own? Yeah. You, a lot of Europeans did that back in the day. Well, some, yeah, horses. I, yeah. <laughs> horses. No, it's a natural, but it's a naturally occurring hormone in horses. So it's different than horse. Yeah. yeah and beetles, I think. Or cows. Um, yeah, no, I there think was one study with cows, right? And they they mm -hmm. did um, 
they have the control group and then the, the equipoise group. And they when they tested them both at the end of the study, they all tested positive for equipoise. They realized that cows produce boldenone as well. Ah, That's right, right, product. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's funny in that sense that only boldenone has been extensively studied in this context and not the other hormones where you would expect, you know, in a safety and efficacy profile study that masterone or primobolin or trimbolone at least would have some scientific data. But again, masterone and primobolin is paper thin and only in the context of cancer. Yeah. And, and trimbolone, there's nothing to be found uh, unless you go to the vault of Merck. <laughs> yeah, they, and there was nothing on kidney stuff there. No, no, no it was more there was, there was trials on outcomes of pregnant women and things like that. Yeah, uh, the, the, the probably the reason why they did the EQ is when, when it was parenobol, it was around from what nineteen thirty nine to nineteen seventy nine, so it was a prescription mm -hmm. drug for a long time. Yeah, but mm -hmm. hard to find. I don't know a lot of bodybuilders from the seventies that didn't even had access to it, even though it was around. Yeah, and otherwise they probably got the the veterinary grade, yeah, the fifty milligrams for one yeah, milliliter, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, Ganabol. <laughs> oh man, or the big Pfizer Equipoise uh, bottles, a fifty milliliter. Yeah, the uh, jacket. Yeah, yeah, the ones you can fucking hammer somebody to death with. Um, yeah, so so in that context, like scientifically, there's not much to go with, and we do know that oxidative stress and and high blood pressure obviously is deleterious to kidney health. But I always wonder if there's something else, like, I, um, regarding Boston Lloyd passing away, right? He was pretty reckless, but we always suspected that due to his abuse of adipotide, that his kidney started to fail really uh, later on in life. So adipotide is a is a peptide that causes apoptosis in the fat cells, and you have to inject that sub-Q. But obviously, if you inject something subcutaneously, it might cause systemic. And it could probably also cause apoptosis in the nephrons. Um, so I always tell people to avoid compounds like adipotide because that sounds like kidney disease in a bottle, basically, or kidney failure in a bottle. Yeah, people still use it, though. Oh, I'm fine. You're fine until you're not. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, kidneys don't really show physical stress until they're at 25%. And at that point, you're on dialysis. Yeah. Mine, was, mine was functioning at 40 and I had no mm -hmm. physical signs that it was. Oh, yeah, you have one kidney, right? Yeah, I have my unilateral renal agenesis. Okay. So you have to be extra careful. So, so you, like Not you, you make. Yeah, Sorry, go, go ahead. On. No, you can go on. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, of course, you, you learn to live with that. So mm -hmm. maybe you can give some insight on what you typically avoid, what you have to do proactively to keep your single kidney functioning to highest capacity. So it's not as rare as people would think it seems to mostly be occurring in men when women ha are born with so it's something you're born with uh mm -hmm. it's supposed to be on chromosome six it's a defect of okay. chromosome six i don't have a defect on my chromosome six so they're not sure where mine came from um it's it's generally carried on the mother's side down and expressed in the sun it's found in mothers with double uterus a lot of times okay. will pass on that kidney gene but again they don't understand the connection there mm. um I didn't discover it till I was 40. Right. And I was uh, out of the gym at that period of time for a, like a decade. Uh, and I was drinking a lot of alcohol at that time, which okay. sure did not help my kidneys. Um, I had smoked in the past, which probably didn't help my kidneys. Mm -hmm. um, not eating any sort of structured diet for that period of time as well. And when it was discovered, it was my EGFR was a 40. So again, wow. no physical signs that it was running poorly, but close enough that it was a um, a trouble. Um, I, at that point, I just went back to the gym. I stopped drinking. I haven't drank since. Um, my diet, I obviously I cleaned my diet back up and I went back to what I'm doing now. Um, I did introduce testosterone at that point, mm -hmm. which, uh, just for general health, my mm -hmm. testosterone was low. Um, later on, I introduced growth hormone, which probably was the largest contributor to improving my kidney function. My EGFR is now a 108. Okay. So I went from 40 to 108 and regrew my nephrons. And it's um, an EGFR based on cystatin C or creatinine? Uh, even my regular EGFR with weight not, muscle mass not included was a right. 108. Okay. Um, so that was probably the largest contributor for me. But the warning is if people are using underground lab, uh, GH that's not necessarily going to have the same effect, right? Because of the right. Biloxima 188 that we talked about mm -hmm. in the, the liver one.
right? We, did we talk about in the last video? Yeah. Yeah. We the additive, um, that can cause other. So I usually see what guys do in the generic stuff when they get to like six IUs or two milligrams, the kidney function starts to go down. Mm. Right? When they titrate right. the dose down, a lot of times it'll go back up. That doesn't mean every single brand of underground lab GH is going to do that, but we don't know what grade fillers they're using. That's the issue. No, yeah, and they don't test for that. A Janoshek or the other labs, they don't test for the, no, uh, the they're fillers. They're isolating the GH part. So right. um, just a warning, I wouldn't go try to mimic that at home yourself without. So I'm monitored by a doctor. Um, right. So it's a little different. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't think I do anything crazy out of the ordinary to my, maintain it. Like I said, I, I would never drink alcohol again. Uh, I use creatine. So creatine in recent studies has actually shown it improves kidney function especially mm -hmm. people with kidney disease. Um, my protein is a gram per pound or a little more. That doesn't affect kidney function. In That's, my pretty case. Low. Um, That's pretty low. Yeah, I burned down a little bit. I think I used to eat more. Just I don't even know what it was doing when I was eating that much. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't think anything out of the ordinary. I think it's just being aware. You know, I obviously I don't play any contact sports anymore, things like that. All right. <laughs> you know, and the last thing you I want is some high yeah, impact. I, to, to yeah, I'm not allowed back. to do that. I'm not supposed to ski anymore. Um, uh -huh. You know, that kind of stuff. But I don't think anything really out of the ordinary. Just, you know, get labs. Right. Keep track you know, of it. And it's, you know, it, it, it could be worth getting, you know, some scans or ultrasounds just to have a look at your organs. Because like I said, it's not that rare. They usually find it during an autopsy, though. Most men aren't aware that they have it for most of their life. Ah, right. So it's something you live with, and then it, it progresses to the point that it's still livable till you pass away. Well, what was fascinating is, I guess, a lot of people with, not necessarily the majority, but a lot, a lot of people with it will end up developing high blood pressure uh, mm -hmm. or diabetes or, or something related to kidney health like that. And so then the doctor will start to figure out what's wrong. I didn't have any of those signs. My blood pressure was always normal. Mm -hmm. I, obviously, I'm not overweight. I have diabetes. I don't have any of the classic symptoms of someone that with with kidney issues. Right. So they it went undetected. And when you know when you're younger and the doctor palpitates to like feel your organs, I don't know what he was feeling because there's no kidney there. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me, misdiagnosis of the century, right? It's, yeah. Uh, when they're, it's they're, a, please, please, sir, please, please do an ultrasound or yeah. an MRI. So see what's going on. 